The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, the vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, O peoples, all of you. Listen, O earth, and all who are in it, that the sovereign Lord may witness against you the Lord from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads the high places of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the house of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. All her idols will be broken to pieces. All her temp temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images. Since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes, as the wages of prostitutes, they will again be used. Because of this, I weep and wail. I go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. For her wound is incurable. It has come to Judah. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. Tell it not in Gath. Weep not at all. In Beth Ophrah, roll in the dust. Pass on in nakedness and shame, you who live in Shaphir. Those who live in Zanan will not come out. Beth Ezel is in mourning. Its protection is taken from you. Those who live in Maroth writhe in pain, waiting for relief, because disaster has come from the Lord, even to the gate of Jerusalem. You who live in Lachish, harness the team to the chariot. You were the beginning of the sin of the daughter of Zion, for the transgressions of Israel were found in you. Therefore, you will give parting gifts to Morasheth Gath, the town of Akrib, Akzib, will prove deceptive to the kings of Israel. I will bring a conqueror against you who live in Marashah. He who is the glory of Israel will come to Adalam. Shave your heads in mourning for the children in whom you delight. Make yourselves as bald as the vulture, for they will go from you into exile. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light they carry it out, because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them. They defraud a man of his home, a fellow man of his inheritance. Therefore, says the, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. In that day, men will ridicule you. They will taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our fields to, to traitors. Therefore, you will have no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by lot. Do not prophesy, their prophets say. Do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. 
Should it be said, O house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord angry? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to him whose ways are upright? Lately my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the rich robe from those who pass by without a care. Like men returning from battle, you drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes. You take away my blessing from their children forever. Get up, go away, for this is not your resting place, because it is defiled, it is ruined beyond all remedy. If a liar and deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy you for you plenty of wine and beer, this would be just the prophet for this people. Amen, and may God bless his word to us. Derek. Well, it is a longer reading this morning, but you do get a sense of the, uh, the righteous indignation of the Lord. So let's pray as we come to this passage. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we recognise that in your holiness you do not tolerate sin. As we look at your word this morning, by your spirit, please convict us, but also teach us and encourage us. For Lord, we are but dust, and unless you sustain us, we shall not survive. Lord, help me to preach with your help this faithful but challenging passage this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Perched like an eagle's nest on the edge of a coastal mountain range, nearly a thousand metres above sea level, you can still find the ancient ruins of a town, if we can take that back, thanks Lisa, of a town called Morisheth Gath. This is where Micah grew up, almost 750 years before the birth of Jesus. Morasheth is a beautiful place. It's blessed with fertile soil, fast-running streams, and a fantastic view of the coastal plains down along the Mediterranean Sea. It was Jerusalem's eye in the sky. And if you could stand in Micah's place today, you would see spread out below you fields of barley and wheat and olives and grapes, crops that were grown down in the plains to feed the people of Jerusalem. It must have been an interesting place to live, a market city bustling with farmers and merchants and traders and priests and bureaucrats and soldiers too, because Morasheth was also a military town. See, there weren't very many roads that ran up from the sea to the city in those days, but the road through Morasheth was one of them. So troops had long been stationed there to keep watch over the whole region. And in Micah's day, there had been peace. For King Uzziah had ruled in Jerusalem for 52 years, the longest reign of any king in Israel or Judah. Not since the days of King Solomon had the nation had it so good. But all that was about to change. For the people had fallen into a deep spiritual malaise. Jerusalem and Samaria had become bywords for oppression. And now King Uzziah had died, the king of Jerusalem and Judah. And Jotham, his son, was crowned king in his place. This was the year 742 B.C., and this was when the Spirit of the Lord really began to move in the land. First, in the year that King Uzziah died, 742 BC, Isaiah began to prophesy in Jerusalem. And then just down the road in Morasheth, Micah too was about to receive his calling from the Lord, as we see in chapter 1, verse 1. 
the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. The vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem, both the north and the south. So let's meet the man from Moresheth in verses 1 and 2. This is my first point for today. His name, Micah, is a shortened form of Micaiah, just like we might shorten Michael to Mike. So Micaiah is shortened to Micah. And Micaiah, or Micah, literally means, who is like the Lord? It's a whole sentence in a name. Who is like the Lord? And since we know that this was a time of apostasy and backsliding, I think Micah's name is very significant. It suggests to me that his parents were believers who wanted their son to grow up in the fear and knowledge of the Lord. So they named him Micah, who is like the Lord. There's no one like him. And when he grew up, Micah's life became a fulfillment of the identity that his parents had given him in his name. And he became a prophet of the true and living God. It can't have been easy, it never was easy, it never is easy to be a faithful proclaimer of God's word. Just like in our day, so in his, the people had become corrupt and distracted and complacent. Many were simply not interested in hearing God's word at all. Their hearts were hardened, the wound had become incurable. In fact, Micah says, and I chose this last verse as the finishing point for our reading this morning, chapter 2, verse 11. If a liar and deceiver comes to you and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, he would be just the prophet for this people. Sounds like Australia, doesn't it? A prophet of wine and beer. And it was a sick church. And it was a sick society. They didn't want to hear from Micah. Give us a prophet after our own heart. A prophet of gender fluidity and drag queens and Halloween. A prophet of sport and fun and parties and beer. Give us a perverted prophet. We don't want a prophet of the Lord. We want a prophet of love who approves of our moral diversity and Let's us do what we want when we want with no consequences. In a world that's not so very different to our own, the word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth and he began to speak. And he said in verse 2, Hear, O peoples, all of you. Listen, O earth, and all who are in it, the fullness of it that the sovereign Lord may witness against you, the holy Lord, from his temple. I want you to notice, first of all, to whom God's word is addressed. Do you notice? O peoples. It's talking about groups of peoples, nations, people groups. O peoples, all of you. O earth and all who are in it. Yes, God speaks to his own people first, but he is also speaking to you and me today, isn't he? This message is for all people everywhere. It is a universal message. And we need to listen because it doesn't go out of date. This message is relevant for all people from all ages and every generation. Hear, O peoples, all of you. This means you and me. Listen, O earth, and all who are in it. This means our community, our neighbours and the world, that the sovereign Lord may witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. And now, behold... In verses 3 and 4, here he comes. And this is my second point for this morning. The Lord is coming. In verse 3, look. 
For Micah has a vision of what is about to occur. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads the high places of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him. The valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. It's a dramatic scene. The highest places on our planet, as it were, are just beneath the feet of God in Micah's vision. And the mountains melt and the valleys split apart. Who is like our God? Remember Micah's name? Who is like our God? Striding across creation, coming down to meet with mankind. I guess it's not hard to imagine it inside of blockbuster movie event, but this is real. This is a spiritual reality that Micah is describing. The Lord himself is coming to judge the earth, to judge the world in righteousness, and he will do it. He did it in Micah's day, destroying Samaria by the hand of the Assyrians in 721 BC. He did it again in 586 BC when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. Again in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple. There are many other occurrences and events, like when Hezekiah was penned up like a bird in a cage, and you get the sense of that movement of the uh, Assyrians right to the gates of the city of Jerusalem. But these are just mere foreshadowings of the final judgment that's still to come, the judgment that you and I must also face, the judgment that brings even the mightiest kings of this world before the the throne of God like, like just ants, less than ants, as God looks down upon us. One day soon we shall all have to stand before the judgment throne of God and give an account of our lives to him. Judgment is coming because the God of righteousness is going to call us to account. And this is Micah's message to you and to me. His message is don't be found naked and ashamed before this God, this God of Israel, the Lord himself, but through faith prepare yourself for his coming. For us as Christians today, we know that we have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ through faith, that we might be found pure and blameless before the Lord. But are you clothed in his righteousness? Have you come to the cross and accepted from Jesus the forgiveness that we've just been represented to us in the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood, a perfect sacrifice for sin, that we might have peace with God? Micah's message to you and me is that we need to get ready because judgment is coming. Now for us, the history of Jerusalem and Samaria are examples really of what not to do. Much of what our passage today describes of the church in those days is an example of what not to do. For their wound is self-inflicted And it has become incurable in verses 5 to 9. This is my third point, reading from verse 5. All this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the house of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? And Micah can see the truth. He can see it because God has made it clear to him. He has read the signs of the times in which he lives. And he recognises that the people are their own worst enemies. For by their sins they've offended God so badly that their judgement is inevitable. And many years earlier, after the death of King Solomon, the nation had split in two. So you've got the north and the south. You've got Samaria and Jerusalem. And although it was the northern kingdom of Samaria that went bad first, really Judah was not very far behind What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. 
And like our kids talked this morning, all her idols will be broken to pieces. All her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images. And then God says that he will strip away everything from that city of Samaria where the idolatry reigned. And this stripping away of that capital city's outward glory and exposing, as it were, the foundations of the city, her most private parts of the city, that which was normally covered over is to be revealed. It's only really what she deserves for the prostituting of herself with the nations around. So the church in Samaria might be likened to a spiritual brothel. They'd exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship the creation rather than the creator. And so even within the people of God, there was sexual immorality, there was lies, tyranny, injustice. That's how bad things were. As we read in verse 7, since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes, as the wages of prostitutes, they will be used again. It's like saying, what is Australia's transgression? Is it not Sydney? Brash, party-loving, beer-swilling, beer-swilling Sydney. Lovers of wealth and fame and prosperity, home of the gay and lesbian Mardi Gras. Celebrated. A city that's beautiful to look at on the outside, but spiritually brazen and bankrupt in her rejection of God's word. Do you think God isn't speaking to us today? Isn't he warning us to repent? Isn't he urging us, even as his people, to renew our first love for him? He's reminding us about the very wrath of God that is being poured out and is about to be poured out, even in our own time. Now, I'm not a prophet, but as I look at the world around me, I do think that we are in some very hard times just around the corner. You've seen the news about the expected rise in electricity prices. 50 to 80% increases in electricity prices just around the corner. Costs of mortgages going up. Westpac represents expected 8.5%. That'll be four times what the mortgage rate was just a year ago. Cost of living, the difficulty of acquiring food. We may be facing very unexpected challenges in comfortable Sydney before the year is out. There are rumours that China is ready to take Taiwan within the next 12 months. We may no longer just be looking at war in Ukraine, but war in the Pacific. Are we ready as God's people? I feel about these things as Micah does in verses 8 and 9. Because of this, I will weep and wail. I may not do what he does. I'll go about barefoot and naked. I might refrain from that. But the point is there, isn't it? I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. For her wound is incurable and it has come to Judah. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how can you of all places be infected with Samaria's spiritual syphilis, this incurable disease of idolatry gone mad? It has reached to the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. The ugliness of sin needs to be confronted. 
So I've got a picture up there for you to look at, a picture of syphilis. And as it disgusts us to see what syphilis does to the human body, let us consider what sin does to the soul. And who can we go to to be cured? The point is, if even Jerusalem, the so-called city of God, can be turned into such a den of iniquity, then what hope is there? If the problem of sin is so contagious, who can stand in the presence of a holy God and live? Where can we find hope in this God-rejecting world? No, we are all sinners in the hands of an angry God. This is not a popular thing to say. And this is our own fault. It's not God's fault that we offend him. It's our fault because we reject him and refuse to live our lives the way that he calls us to do. This is my next point in verses 10 to 16. The name Jonathan Edwards may not be so well known as it once was, but he's generally regarded to be America's best theologian, philosopher, and preacher. Himself the son of a preacher, he was born in Connecticut, 1703, and he was smart enough to go to Yale University at the ripe old age of 13. Not bad to go to uni at 13 years old. The thing I want to share with you this morning about Jonathan Edwards is the title of his most famous sermon, which is still in print after 300 years. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. a sermon that he preached to his own church. And what I want to say this morning is that that is exactly where we are today. We are sinners in the hands of an angry God. Not to say that God is eternally angry, no, but he is angry with sin. and We need to accept responsibility for what we've done. So what have we done? Well, the answer is Christians is all too little, all too often. On the whole, we haven't cared about God's wrath enough to pray for our neighbours, our relatives and our friends, but we need to be reminded that God's wrath is real. We haven't been willing, really, to sacrifice our own personal comforts to share the truth. We've largely ignored the cost of many bad, I would say, evil policies that our government has introduced, like abortion, same-sex marriage, euthanasia, and so on. We prefer to duck the issues and hope that someone else will fix them. Well, that's not how to be salt and light in the world. But you may ask, why is God angry with me? Hasn't Jesus died to take away my sins? And isn't God satisfied with his death in my place? Well, yes. He is, but I also want to warn you from too quickly assuming on God's grace. For example, if you claim to be under the anointing grace of the Lord Jesus, then reflect on this. Is your life being lived out in loving obedience to God's word? Is your faith in him a living faith? Remember this warning of God to sinners. It is nothing but God's mere pleasure that keeps you from being this moment swallowed up into everlasting destruction. If we live, it is because of God's grace. If we are forgiven, it is because of Jesus' love. The Father's love poured out for us on the cross. In fact, if God is angry, it is because he loves us. It is a love that arises, or rather it is a wrath that arises out of a love that cares for you. A fatherly concern to correct us and to teach us. And Micah declares this in his song of lament, insisting that even God's people are not immune from his wrath, although his wrath upon his people is meant as discipline. So verse 10, and it begins this whole lament song here, like Micah is leading a parade of lament through the towns as they fall 
Sell it not in Gath, weep not at all. In Beth Ophrah, roll in the dust. Pass on in nakedness and shame, you who live in Shafir. Those who live in Zanan will not come out. Bethel is in mourning, its protection is taken from you. Those who live in Moral thrive in pain, waiting for relief, because disaster has come from the Lord, even to the gate of Jerusalem. You see, the Lord is sovereign in judgment. What a radical thought that disaster has come from the Lord. Even to the gate of Jerusalem. And each name, each place name here becomes a sign of judgment on the people who live there. It's very clever how Micah does this. So that Beth Ophra, Beth Ophra, the house of dust, is the place where they will roll in the dust. If I was to use Australian place names, it would be like saying something like manly will be unmanned. Tweed heads will be torn to shreds. You know, tweed's a fabric. It's torn to shreds. Tamless, Tamworth will be worthless. And that's what Micah is saying. He's seeing the progress of the invading armies, the judgment of God coming through the towns, and he's calling them to repentance. At God's command, foreign armies will come in and tear down the society and it will even come to the city of Jerusalem and although Hezekiah will escape, in 586 BC even the temple in Jerusalem will be destroyed and it happens again under the Romans. And all this is meant as an example to us to call us to repentance. So that comes now to my fifth point this morning about God's justice. God's justice for the oppressed. So there's another thing about God's wrath to remember this morning is that it is a righteous wrath. It's not uh, unjust, it is righteous, perfect in holiness and ready to bring justice to the oppressed. So come down with me to chapter 2, verse 1, where God says this. He says, Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning light they carry them out because it's in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud a man of his home, a fellow man of his inheritance. All these are people for whom money and power are their gods. Again, just like in the kids' talk. They don't care about the rule of law or fairness or right or wrong. For their might is right and they care for themselves. But they've forgotten one thing, haven't they? What have they forgotten? That they too are sinners in the hands of an angry God. They need to read this sermon and repent. And now God's word hangs over them like an executioner's axe, though they don't acknowledge it. Woe to you who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. Do you think that money and power can save you? Do you think you can buy yourself out of trouble? No, I tell you, I've weighed you in my scales and I've found you wanting. It's interesting that in our world today there is an increasing reduction in willingness to stay and fight were an enemy to come. Uh, The percentages of people who would simply get on the next plane and get out of town is getting higher and higher. There's no willingness to defend the society or the world in which we live. And that doesn't bode well for any nation. Not to say that we should will uh, ourselves to have war, but if there was a war, would you stay and fight for Australia? Is there anything that you'd be prepared to defend? 
There's so much that's wicked and maybe it's good the better that we do get invaded or taken over or overrun. It seems to me that for a Christian it ought to be that we desire the, the flourishing and the welfare and the well-being of the, the nation in which we live. Therefore, this is what the Lord says in chapter 2, verse 3. I'm planning disaster against this people, disaster from which you cannot save yourselves. You're going to stay? You're going to run? You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. Are you ready for it? In that day, men will ridicule you, I will taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our fields to traitors. So unjust. Now this may sound like an odd way to taunt an enemy, but I think what's happening here is that these are the words of those who themselves had once defrauded and stolen goods from others. And that's why this becomes a taunt song. It's like God is judging those wicked people and giving them a taste of their own medicine and they don't like it. Just as they once dispossessed the weak, so in their turn they become dispossessed by others who are stronger than they are. And when it happens to them, they will complain most bitterly about it. And they'll weep and they'll wail as they see their property and possessions taken. And they'll say, you can't do that to us. We'll be ruined. And people will laugh in their faces. Do you hear that? We'll be ruined. We'll be ruined. It's like Elon Musk taking over Twitter. Let this sink in, he said cheekily, as he proceeded to sack some of their top executives. What goes round comes round. It's a curious thing that the wicked are happy to deny justice to others, but they expect the system to defend them. The moment they're in trouble, the police have to be at their door, the lawyers have to be ready to defend their case, and Micah says, not this time. Verse 5, therefore you will have no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by lot. In other words, you'll have no defence and you will have no share in God's heavenly inheritance, you will be cut off. This is one of those uncomfortable truths that Satan always tries to suppress. He blinds the world with lies so that people oppose, oppose God's grace. But Micah knows the truth. For his parents gave him that name. Who is like the Lord? There's no one like him. A God of righteousness, without injustice. A God who forgives all our transgressions when we turn to him in humble repentance. So the answer to this problem is really very simple. It's my final point today. Fear God and live. Recognise him as Lord. Now this message is rejected by some. As Micah points out in verse 6, here's the first reaction to God's word, the reaction of the world. Do not prophesy, their prophets say. Do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Not listening, not listening. It's a quotation by Micah of the things the false prophets say. Now here's the truth with a capital T, verse 7. Should it be said, O house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord angry? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to him whose ways are upright? I think this is the key verse in the whole passage, actually. Do not my words do good to him whose way is upright? You'd better believe it. His word brings life and hope to those who are upright, to those who trust in the Lord and walk in his ways. Now, brothers and sisters, we've only begun to enter into the world of Micah of Morasheth this morning. But we've begun to get a sense of his devotion and love for the Lord and for the people 
Though they be in rebellion against God, he grieves and mourns over it, and he longs to see them come to repentance and faith. He bears his name. Who is like the Lord? And he witnesses faithfully in hard times. As Christians today, we need to keep reminding ourselves of what we believe about our God. There is only one God and that all the idols are but handmade bits of wood and silver and stone. Maybe our idols today are a little more sophisticated, like piles of money in the bank account, but they're idols nonetheless. I was watching Martin Isles last night uh, down in Canberra. His observation that the great idol of our time is our identity. We reject the identity given to us by God and we try to create our own identity, our own gender, our own take on the world. And where there used to be blasphemy, speaking out against God, now we have hate speech, which is an attack on the God that we've created for ourselves, the identity that cannot be challenged. It was an interesting thought. Well, as Christians, we need to remind ourselves of what we believe about God because it's only as we understand that that we understand our place in his world. And let it not be said of us what was said of the people in the last part of our passage today. Can you imagine being so compromised by sin that you became just like the world around you and indistinguishable from it. Imagine a church where people were lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God, not willing to speak up on anything that might affect their careers or bank accounts. Look at verse 8. Let us not be like this. Lately, my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the rich robe of those who pass by without a care, like men returning from battle. You drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes. You take away my blessing from their children forever. Get up! Go away! For this is not your resting place, because it is defiled. It is ruined beyond all remedy. If a liar and deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, he would be just the prophet for this people. Let us not be like that today. The temptation is always there. But rather let us fear God this morning that we might not die in our sins. Let us be quick to confess that we are indeed sinners worthy of God's judgment. The only reason why we're not plunged into hell this very moment is because of the mercy and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us learn from the mistakes of God's people in the past and not repeat them. Let us remember our first love and turn back in repentance and faith to Jesus. For he alone is the one who stands in our defence and intercedes on our behalf. This is the good news of the gospel that we lay hold of this morning, that the king has become our saviour and he is a friend of sinners who takes away the sins of the world by placing them on his own shoulders and nailing them to the cross. Can God be angry? Yes, he can. But today's passage reminds us that in Christ, God takes his own wrath upon himself and thereby opens a new and living way for us to come into the presence of our loving God and heavenly Father. Do not my words do good to him whose ways are upright? Yes, indeed they do. Therefore, who is like the Lord? There is no one like him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's been challenging this morning to consider the word of Micah, for it is a word of judgment, even upon your own people. And in our hearts we quail because we know our own unworthiness but also we rejoice because you have not left us without hope in this world but came to us in the person of Jesus that we might have peace with you. Lord, help us to claim that promise and to stand on the rock that is immovable and true. Keep us from temptation and complacency and sin 
and help us to shine for you until Christ returns. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.